So back in the day, you know, the ivory tower, it referred to a place or a condition of seclusion from life's harsh realities, right? The thing is, in American English, there's been a curious development. The ivory tower often refers to academia and the humanities in particular. Now, since linguistic change doesn't just reflect social change, but is social change, I want to talk about the implied separation of higher education from the real world. Now, this is complicated and undoubtedly contentious stuff, so if I manage to merely provoke you with my brief remarks today, then, then good, I'll be happy. So, who's afraid of this ivory tower? Well, conservative right-wing groups such as Campus Watch, David Horowitz's Freedom Center, and the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, they all do. They fear the occupying of education by progressive forces promoting social justice and the decolonization of institutions. Now, such conservative groups claim to promote the disinterested pursuit of knowledge, but this notion of disinterested seems to me to, to limit education to the pursuit of the status quo, and this status quo is something bell hooks refers to as the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Now, liberals and those on the left fear higher education on account of the rise in bureaucratic assessment, the dumbing down of curricula, and the politicization of pedagogy. More importantly, though, there's a general fear about crossing that murky line separating the permissible from the politically taboo. Now, this is enforced by a sly civility policing the boundaries of acceptable discourse. The result is a corrosive self-censorship among educators, one that effectively maintains the status quo. And of course, I don't need to remind most of you here, nearly everybody fears higher education because of the costs, and they should. The specter of debt shapes us into subjects that learn to accept declining economic prosperity and limited political power. And debt also limits in advance the selection of a course of study. You may love literature, but in the end, you may end up well, opting for something that appears to be more practical. And I get that. So nearly all recognize, at least tacitly, what is at stake with higher education. A college degree is not just the new high school diploma promising a brighter future. College is a key site for the production of subjects and the production of knowledge. What kinds of knowledge will you acquire and what kinds of subjects will you become? Now this can be crudely formulated at times. So are you going to learn how to question and disrupt authoritarian structures or will you accept authoritarianism and say the ubiquity of a war on terror? Are you going to agree to ongoing economic exploitation and social dispossession, or will you help organize along lines of solidarity to fight for social and economic justice? Of course, yes, there are other ways of conceptualizing the options, but before I get to that, let's look at the idea of this ivory tower. As an independent artistic sphere, the ivory tower was a key metaphor for 19th century romanticism, and it represented a homeless shelter for intellectuals in an increasingly materialistic world. But today, instead of equating academia with an ivory tower, we should perhaps consider it as a corporation. Indeed, higher education has historically served elitist principles. We might think of it as a knowledge factory with the tendency to distribute discrete bits of knowledge that can build only one model, like today's Lego sets. I've got a four and a half year old, so I know all about Lego sets these days. The idea, though, of a corporate university suggests a flow of influence from the real world into higher education. Now, the dominant real world ideas since the 1970s have been those of neoliberalism or economic Darwinism, as some call it. This is a set of ideas and practices promoting free market fundamentalism where the capitalist market is allowed to resolve all problems and define value. With its models of entrepreneurship and self-interest, it attempts to suppress forms of solidarity that challenge market-driven values. In higher education, this has meant the closing down of philosophy departments, comparative literature programs, and the discontinuation of political theory at some schools. What is deemed unmarketable, not useful for capital accumulation, or politically disruptive is subject to elimination. Who needs reflective thinking when pseudoscientific paradigms can replace education with training? For example, consider what happened to Professor Stephen Salida this past summer. Some of you undoubtedly know about this. 
The University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, after offering Salida a job with tenure, decided to take it back. In effect, they fired him. The administration's decision, and this is the important bit, the decision came in response to Salida's pointed criticism on Twitter about Israeli military action in Gaza. The apparent problem was the tone of his tweets. It was uncivil. Now, Chancellor Wise at the University of Illinois announced that the school, as she put it, will not tolerate personal and disres disrespectful words or actions that demean and abuse either viewpoints themselves or those who express them. Now, when did viewpoints get protected from abuse? And what about the rights of those who disagree with the menacing status quo? Salida's tweets on a complex matter of public concern were deemed beyond the pale. But what line did he cross exactly? Sadly, Salida's is merely the most recent case of the narrowing of academic discourse under the guise of maintaining civility. And such policing of higher education and the erosion of academic freedom tend to result in the homogenization of thought. And this seems to imply that we have good solutions to today's problems but I'm not even sure we fully understand what the problems are. But the academy is not simply a space to socialize people into docile subjects, thank God, right? It can also be a key site for articulating difference and opposition to the world around us. For example, students in Quebec, they successfully protested against a proposed tuition fee increase in 2012. They pushed for the freedom of free education and joined forces with working class families. Such struggles keep alive the ideal of what higher education could be. The so-called ivory tower is a precarious site, easily co-opted by neoliberal forces with the cor their corporate talk of excellence and leadership. Colleges and universities can also produce engaged and critical subjects of democratic values. So what is to be done? Sadly, the response of many is silence or resignation. But there is pushback coming from those who refuse to sit back and watch higher education be retooled as an institution for reproducing the latest ruling class. Promoting social justice is an important step forward. Fighting white supremacist capitalist patriarchy is a pedagogical imperative. But here, I want to introduce a caveat and argue for the study of what neoliberal subjects and even some on the left consider useless. Think here of, oh, say, Romantic poetry, or Renaissance art, or German Enlightenment philosophy, or ancient history, for that matter. When both neoliberal subjects and left-leaning scholar activists alike view certain bodies of knowledge as useless, if not dangerous, we may have bumped into one of the limits of current thinking. And the limits of reason can conceal other pieces of the puzzle that we may want to take a look at. As the German philosopher Theodor Adorno put it, the undiminished presence of suffering, fear, and menace necessitates that the thought that cannot be realized should not be discarded. With Adorno, we might consider that the persistence of suffering requires us to pursue unrealized possibilities and the seemingly unlikely sources of their realization. Now let me elaborate this with a scene from the film Dr. Zhivago from 1965. This may appear crazy, but trust me, there's a, there's a point to it. If you haven't seen the movie, by the way, you should. It's, it's pretty cool. Now this, this film, Dr. Zhivago, was liberally adapted from a novel by the Russian writer Boris Pasternak. And it was incorporated, it, the, the novel in the film incorporated Pasternak's critical views of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. The one, of course, that ushered in Soviet communism and all that stuff. Now, in one scene, the main character, Zhivago, speaks with a Red Army leader, and he comments on the revolutionary process. Zhivago says enthusiastically to the, the Red Army leader, you guys lay life on the table, and you cut out all the tumors of injustice? Marvelous. But when the Red Army leader encourages him to join the Communist Party, Zhivago replies, Ah, uh, cutting out the tumors of injustice, that's a deep operation. Someone must keep life alive by living while you do it. Isn't that right? Pasternak's novel delves into the problems of living under a regime that demands everything be subordinated to the dominant political order. 
The film, produced during the Cold War, highlights Pasternak's critique of the USSR. But today, given the predatory practices of neoliberalism the world over, and given the hollowing out of US higher education according to the demands of free market fundamentalism, perhaps Dr. Zhivago is more timely than it may seem. I suggest we reflect more on the delicate operation of forming subjects. But also with Zhivago, we need to consider how we're going to keep life and the imagination alive. The homogenization of the educational curriculum bespeaks an arrogant disregard for the thought that is yet to be realized. Fighting for social justice is a part of the solution. Thinking about our place in the world through arts and history is another. We should also question how we have come to think the way we do by engaging with our theoretical presuppositions. Now, this is often denigrated as, you know, scholarship in the ivory tower or something like that. But here again, why not question the dichotomy of sterile theory versus virile praxis, thinking versus doing? If theory has a bad name these days, it may owe something to the marketized demands of capitalism and the authoritarian climate inhospitable to such questioning. It's a common prejudice that when one engages in theory and critique, you have to provide a solution. Thinking must be pragmatic and have useful purposes. This seems like a trap. Purely theoretical critiques have altered consciousness and, as a result, social reality. Perhaps this explains the common notion of academia, and in particular, the humanities, as an ivory tower. This imaginary construct inoculates us against the radical challenge that a change in consciousness can bring about. If we don't hold on to what appears useless or unmarketable or irrelevant or politically disruptive, we accept the dominant neoliberal way of framing value, or we fall into the trap of fighting back on the very terms set by those in power. So let's change the terms. Let's learn not only to combat the enemies of social justice, let's learn to realize our place in something larger than our individual selves, something larger than the status quo in opposition to it. Let's make sure there's something left to fight for. Let's keep Zhivago's patient alive just a little bit longer. Some of the resources for this difficult undertaking reside precisely in what is dubbed unmarketable or beyond the pale today. How about we get into this more here at Scripps? Time's up. Thanks.